Welcome to the RF Integrated Circuits course which is EE6240. So before we start with the theory, I'll give you, uh, I'll tell you what textbooks are going to be used for the course, some reference textbooks. I'll cover the course format and then uh, I'll talk about the prerequisites. Then I'll quickly tell you what topics will be covered in this course. So first the textbooks. So we'll primarily rely on two textbooks. The first one is called RF microelectronics. This is very useful for systems and radio architectures. So this book is written by a professor called Behzad Razavi from UCLA and is published by Prentice Hall. The second important book we'll use is called The Design of CMOS Radio Frequency Integrated Circuits. And this is very useful for the circuits portion of the course. So he gives a lot of detail on RF integrated circuits. This book is written by Professor Thomas Lee. From Stanford. And it's published by Cambridge University Press. Another useful reference is called VLSI for wireless communication. By Professor Bosco Leon. This is also published by Prentice Hall. So we will primarily use the first two textbooks, but this one is useful because it bridges the gap between systems and circuits. As far as the course format is concerned, you should remember that this is a advanced this is an advanced level mtech course or uh, so what that means is you should be prepared to do a lot of work outside class through projects and assignments so we will have four mini projects in this course which will account for 40 percent of the grade we'll have one final exam which will account for 30 percent of the grade we'll have a journal paper seminar which will account for 20 percent of the day and probably five to six homeworks which will account for 10 percent of the grade. <coughs> and <coughs> what we'll do is as far as submission goes we'll do it through email. The prerequisites for this class for this class are EE5390, which is analog IC design. Or if you have a similar background, 
that is that is satisfactory too should have a good understanding of of mosfet operation so some basic mosfet devices and the small signal model of the mosfet you should also have an understanding of of basic signals and systems so what i mean is you should be comfortable with fourier series fourier transforms etc and you should be comfortable with thinking in the frequency domain and obviously the time domain too so the topics we'll cover in this course are so we'll cover the rf basics and then we'll also give a brief introduction to analog and digital modulation modulation schemes then we'll cover s parameters resonance and impedance matching after that <clears throat> we'll look at what kind of inductors capacitors and other passive circuits are available for use with integrated rf circuits we'll have a quick introduction to short channel mosfet operation and behavior next we'll study noise and distortion you'll see that noise you might have already studied in the analog ic scores but distortion the way distortion is quantified in rf circuits is slightly different from that in other analog circuits then we'll look at receiver architectures what we'll do is at first we'll try to briefly touch upon receiver architectures so that we can start looking at some of the circuits that are involved in receivers and transmitters then later we'll study transmitters and receivers in a little bit more detail so after that excuse me after that we'll look at rf circuits so we'll look at L low noise amplifiers mixers voltage controlled oscillators and if you have time we'll also try to look at power amplifiers so we'll primarily look at design and operation of these circuits then we'll come back of course to rx and tx architectures then we'll probably have maybe one class of introduction to rf layout so now that we have a some understanding of what we are going to study in this course let's start off with the first lecture
so what do you understand by radio frequency so the modern understanding is people tend to think of let's say very high frequencies right transmission reception and so on and in reality you can you can define rf as any frequency or rather the frequency of any signal that carries information it can be wired or wireless but you'll see nowadays the majority of rf work happens in the wireless domain some examples are cellular phones wireless lan television systems am and fm radios and so on right there are hundreds of examples <clears throat> if you look at modern systems so you have three major portions so you have the digital portion you have the mix signal portion and you have the rf portion and the rf portion dire directly interfaces with the antenna so if you see the way data flows in the system the digital system interfaces with the analog system uh, with the mix signal or analog system the mix signal system interfaces with the rf system and the rf system in, in interfaces with the antenna so this is the flow of data but if you look at most of most of these integrated circuits what you'll find is you also see interface in the form of control so you have several means of control exercised by the digital system over the mix signal and rf domains what happens in the digital system so you have what is called baseband processing so typically this could be the processor it could include the modem etc the mix signal portion includes mix signal portion includes the adc the analog to digital converter the digital to analog converter etc you you have a bunch of other systems so you have the audio amplifier and so on the rf system usually contains low noise amplifiers mixers and nowadays the pas and so on so there are lots of components so what we study in this course we'll study transmitter architectures transceiver architectures and we'll study the circuits this usually comes under the rf systems domain because you need to understand the interaction between the rf and the baseband and rf ics of course includes design which is circuit design and typically you you look at as part of this you look at new circuit topologies
Now, what makes RF so interesting? What you'll find is RF is very multidisciplinary. Okay. What does that mean? So if you look at RF design, there are a number of ingredients which go into RF design. So you need to understand the theory of signal propagation. You need to understand IC design. So you need to understand CAD tools. You need to understand a little bit of COM theory. You need to know a bit about wireless standards. You need to know your microwave theory well. And you need to know, have a good understanding of TX and RX architectures. Okay, to lesser or greater extents, you need to know all of these. Now what we'll study in this course, we'll study this in detail and we'll try to study this in as much detail as possible. And the other thing to keep in mind is you folks will be using CAD tools for your simulations and design. The thing to remember is <coughs> CAD tools are indispensable. For modern RFIC design. <coughs> However, do not over rely on CAD tools completely. Keep in mind your intuition and knowledge. We will also look at the what Professor Razavi calls the RF design hexagon. which des describes the trade-offs in RF design very well. So what are the different parameters that you would trade off? You have noise, you have power, you have frequency, gain, your supply voltage, let's call it VDD. But all of these are two-way arrows. Then you have linearity. So you have a design hexagon. So each one of these can be traded off with one or more of the others in a specific way. So the next thing you'll find is in this course, most of the work we do will be in CMOS. Why? So the traditional reason is in the case of digital circuits, so you have several advantages require very few devices per gate. So that makes it very attractive as far as density goes. Then you have no static power dissipation. Then the MOS devices can be easily scaled down. to achieve higher and higher densities. Okay, And coupled with this, you also have what are 
lower fabrication costs compared to bipolar processes especially in the presence of high volumes now why would you want to use it for analog or rf for that matter so of course the number one reason is you have the possibility of what is called a system on chip okay so what that means is you can have a single chip with digital mix signal rf okay all three functionalities and that means the lesser number of interfaces with the external world which is always better for us as well as cheaper you can sell the whole chip at a much cheaper price but what you'll find is as you delve deeper you'll find that there are certain issues nowadays before you go there let's look at one more advantage of cmos for analog which is they have become comparable to bjts in ft which is speed and this is a little bit more controversial but it's in some cases their noise performance is better we'll just put a question mark there just to see we'll will it will require a little bit more investigation so if you see 20 years ago cmos was considered to be very slow very noisy but nowadays the first choice of anybody who's going to design analog sec analog ics is cmos what are the issues with cmos no longer cheap so now what has happened is the number of masks has blown up which means a larger cost lithography lithography is getting very expensive because you need to go to better and better rather more and more resolution for the lithography so it's getting extremely expensive and the next problem is leakage current with your current nanometer level cmos circuits cmos transistors you have a large leakage current which means static power consumption so you have to be very careful with your design if you look at i i believe in the mid 60s gordon moore uh, at intel came up with what is now known as moore's law what is that he claimed that the number of transistors actually his claim was slightly different he said the number of component but the number of transistors is also acceptable number of transistors on an ic doubles every 2 years now you'll also see multiple numbers for this 2 years because some people say it, it used to be 1 year then it was 2 years some people will say 18 months so the exact time does not matter what matters is there is some kind of linear relationship as time in in terms of if you, if you look at the number of transistors versus time
and if you see more or less so if you see we have gone somewhere around this linear kind of scale but we more or less lie on this axis on this line okay now coming to now that we have had a quick look at why we are using cmos and what rf is let's look at what we need to know a little bit uh, some other things we need to know about rf so let's first look at path loss so let's say you have so just remember this is the standard notation for an antenna so let's say you have a transmitter and it is transmitting a signal to a receiver which is at a distance d from the transmitter what you'll find out is the the signal power loss can be shown to be proportional to d squared in theory well and good now what happens if you have a a reflective surface that causes multiple paths let's say a second path so let's say you have a a reflective surface so this is your direct transmission and this is your a second transmission path reflective path what you can find is that the the power loss is empirically proportional to the fourth power of the distance <coughs> now in real life you can have multiple reflections you could have moving obstacles which means time dependent reflections and which means time dependent power loss the phase of the signal path matters in other words you could have constructive or destructive interference so depending on all of these things you could get a certain power profile at the receiver so what you'll find so or if you take into account all of these you get a phenomenon called multi path fading so if you look at your log of your power loss versus the distance what you'll find is you have a certain ideal slope of 4 but your real signal could 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 do something like this right this is your actual loss so it's just an the slope of 4 is an empirical quantity okay so now next ne let, let's look at what is meant by diversity what do you understand by diversity it refers to some kind of redundancy so usually in the transmitter or 
receiver actually in the transmitter or receiver paths so you have different kinds of diversity so if you see you have what is called spatial diversity or antenna diversity what does this mean all this means is you have two or more antennas and you can choose to operate either uh, if if you have two antennas you can choose to operate either one of the antennas so that your probability of having fading at both antennas at the same time is very little usually you would have some multiple of lambda by 2 spacing between the antennas the reason is if you have completely destructive uh, interference at one of the antennas that means that at the other antenna you would have close to constructive interference now the other kind of diversity is frequency diversity what does this mean this means two or more frequency carriers so you could either transmit and receive at multiple frequencies so that is one option the other option is now this may technically not come under frequency diversity but you could also do what is called frequency hopping that is at every transmission you could change your transmission and receive frequencies so that the probability of having fading at both frequencies will be very little and the last kind of diversity we'll look at is time diversity what is meant by time diversity time diversity refers to so you send the data more than once mainly to overcome short term fading effects for example you could have a let's say an object a moving object maybe a car maybe a person walking through a room it could be a number of things which could cause short term fading so if you send the data once more you are sure to receive it the second or third time so that is time diversity so we'll stop here for today's class and um, and continue on wednesday